The Word for World is Forest is a short novel or novella written by Ursula Le Guin, published in the early 70s. It's an unusual Le Guin. Le Guin, to my mind, tends to write these sprawling sociological studies of alien worlds that are closely uh, reflective of our own. This is not a, an unusual exercise for science fiction authors to perform, but hers tend to be languid and long. This one is very different, at least tonally, at least in the way that it's written. Familiar subject matter. It's a parable about colonialism, the evils thereof. It's a cautionary tale about slavery. It's about the, the oppressed and oppressor relationship and the, I don't know, the moral and spiritual pollution that results from such a relationship, such an encounter. It's about a human colony, a Terran colony from Earth on this heavily forested water world that's mostly ocean, but there are these archipelagos of islands that are densely forested. And there's a logging operation. And there's a, an indigenous alien species that look like green furry apes that are about three or four feet tall. And it turns out are directly descended from the common human stock that's been seeded throughout the universe. It's a Hainish book and in this series, Homo sapiens did not evolve on Earth in the first place. We were seeded there by a species that originally evolved on a, an alien world called Hain. The, uh, the humans on this world from Earth, the Earth humans, look at the indigenous humans as non-human and make them indentured servants on paper. They aren't technically slaves, but in practice they are. And eventually the aliens get sick of it and revolt. One of the things that Le Guin is most praised for is her subtlety and the fact that she can write polemic fiction that doesn't read like polemic. This one's different though. She strikes a different tone, a more combative, a more angry one, and it moves at a quick clip. So if you get bored by Le Guin books or you have in the past like Left Hand or Dispossessed, then probably this one is for you. I think it's most remembered now as the alleged source material for Avatar. People have accused James Cameron of ripping this book off among other books for that plot. I thought that it was gonna be a typical um, eco story about the dangers of pillaging the environment. And it kind of is, and it definitely kind of is not. It is way more about the soft sciences of politics and history. It's very much direct allegory for the Vietnam War. Rather violent, rather uncompromising, and un -Le -Guin -y. I think I've said that three times now. It definitely does not have the same gravity as her great works like Dispossessed and Left Hand. I prefer those. I gave this one around a 7 out of 10. Around? No, I gave it a 7 out of 10. The characters are characters from a novella. There's only so much that you can do with characters in a novella. I think they're good enough. That's one of the things that it gets criticized for is that the characters are flat. You try it. I like it. It is a little bit on the nose. But amazingly dark for Le Guin. You can knock it out in one sitting. It's a good book. It's worth reading. It's not my favorite Le Guin, but it's not bad. The next one that I read was Star Maker by Olaf Stapledon, which was written, I think, in uh, the late 30s was the source material for a bunch of stuff that followed it. One of the most influential works of science fiction, I think, ever. I get that impression, and a lot of work bears its stamp. As I was reading it, I was reminded constantly of the Zones of Thought books by Werner Vinge, reminded constantly of Brian Aldiss, reminded also constantly of Star of the Unborn by Franz Verfel. My, the book that I love to talk about and that I think nobody has probably read still yet, uh, a rare book that was highly influenced by Stapledon. That one's a rare one. It costs like a hundred bucks now. I would probably not spend a hundred on it as much as I love it. Um, but Star Maker, abundant. Nobody reads it. There's no demand for it. It is a stretch to expect a contemporary reader 
to stick with a book like this. It is a work of philosophy that is disguised as a novel. I don't mean that pejoratively. I think that that is literally the case because Stapledon was a philosopher, taught philosophy, and became a novelist in order to present a more lay audience with his ideas. It reads like a work of philosophy. It reads like a series of vignettes or thought experiments or essays. It kind of feels like iRobot on that front. It is more elegant than iRobot. It is more interesting than iRobot. It's in parts much more beautiful than iRobot. Much more beautiful than a lot of books. However, it lacks completely the, the rigid skeleton that I expected and that you would expect from a novel, even a poorly written or boring novel. It simply isn't there. It's all world building and all exposition. There's really nothing else. There are only a couple of characters. It's about a guy, an English man, who's standing outside of his house one night looking up at the stars and astrally projects out of his body essentially and becomes this wandering, discreet point of consciousness in the universe who doesn't seem to have any control over where he goes and when, and he traverses the entirety of the galaxy and then beyond the galaxy, and he moves backwards and forwards through time, meeting different aliens and different alien civilizations, combining consciousness with them until they become a hive mind that wanders hither and yon, collecting more and more alien consciousnesses into itself until it reaches this amalgamated enormity in preparation for a final confrontation with the star maker who is essentially god the density of ideas per page in this is stunning some of the ideas are truly amazing it does take forever to read though this is the culprit behind why it's been three weeks plus since you've seen one of these videos it took me so incredibly long a, because my attention has been divided elsewhere a little bit, um, and B, because even if it weren't, it's a hard book to focus on because I guess I am spoiled by modern conventions of novel writing, and I guess I need those waypoints in place to really stick with something, and I'm not used to reading philosophy, straight philosophy. It's been a long time. So it was a challenge. I think it'll be a challenge for most readers. I intend fully to reread it at some point because I think it just has a maturity and a seriousness and a depth that is pretty special to it. In the same tradition as H.G. Wells, of the serious, you know, the, the science fiction that emerged from a literary tradition, a more mainstream, high literary tradition before the pulps. Um, it is of that family of books and I value it for that found it painfully, um, painfully, almost unbearably boring in parts. The beginning and the end are profoundly beautiful. Everything else in the middle is interesting, but you have to slow down and fill in a lot of the, um, the texture for yourself. It's kind of like those old CGI, uh, you know, the, the behind the scenes of old action movies where they would show the really primitive pre-export CGI frameworks. It's like one of those. It's the, the, the weird shapeless polygons. Not shapeless, the weird textureless, colorless polygons. It's kind of like that. So you have to use your imagination in a way. Hard one to give a rating. I'm glad that I read it. It was really unpleasant to read though for the, the reasons that I, that I described. Um, but an important book. And finally, The Drowned World by Ballard, which was his second novel. It's the first in his disaster sequence, I think, or at least his famous disaster books, Drowned World, The Wind From Nowhere, and The Crystal World. I reviewed Crystal World previously, and I said that it was incredibly well-written, beautifully, masterfully written prose, and that it was slightly pretentious and boring and i kind of have the same set of notes for this it's about a far future i think about a hundred years in the future where solar flares have disrupted something in the i think the ionosphere of earth and has consequently risen the temperature of the planet dramatically to the point where most of the planet 
is uninhabitable or verging on uninhabitable and has been flooded by the water from the melted ice caps. There is a scientific colony studying the flora and fauna of what was previously London and is now a big lake or a series of lakes hemmed in by big mounds of silt that were displaced by the flooding. Strange things are afoot with the animals in the area who have reached monstrous sizes and seem to be regressing along their evolutionary trajectory to the point where there is um, potentially a dinosaur swimming around and the humans succumb one by one to some kind of unexplained force of regression that's making them have this common shared nightmare where they are on the shores of a primordial swamp as iguanas scream at a setting blood red sun. Pretty dramatic stuff. There's a bunch of images like that, a bunch of passages like that in Drowned World that are amazing. There is a sequence where the protagonist dives into um, an abandoned planetarium that's been submerged in water in London and is looking up at a representation of the stars that is sunlight pouring in through this ocean into the planetarium and in this reverie contemplating the universe and uh, feeling his consciousness slip away. Amazing stuff. The character work is rather poor. It gives the impression of being, I don't know, kind of genteel and elevated, it's heavily symbolic, and it kind of plays its symbols with these big magician white-gloved flourishes of the alligators are symbols, and clocks, and this and that and this, and it's all this patchwork of symbolism. And there's something about it that is too formally, I don't know what to call it, academic, I guess. Ballard's great asset, at least in this part of his career, and I've read scantily in Ballard, so I'm still, the cogs are still turning with him. One of the best prose writers ever that I've read in science fiction, I think indisputably. If he were to write something like Star Maker that literally had no plot, I think I would still read it because his writing is just so profoundly good. But has a little bit of the same feeling, to be honest, of this, this um, meandering plot that doesn't seem to really know exactly where it's going, or if it does know where it's going, it certainly doesn't key you in on where it happens to be headed. Which is, I think, another important thing to do in a novel is to give some sense of what the potential payoff might be if you keep reading, or to present questions that that want to be answered. The end result is almost like watching human characters in, uh, in an aquarium. Isn't that an appropriate metaphor? Kind of watching them swim around and bump noses with one another. And uh, there's, uh, there's a villain that's pretty poor, a guy in a white linen suit who commands an army of crocodiles and does nefarious things for the sake of doing nefarious things. Felt really comic booky to me. Ultimately, I didn't dislike it. I was not in love with it. I think High Rise is a way better novel than Drowned World. I will never not be impressed by Ballard, I don't think. But in this instance, this was early in his career as a novelist, I think it would have maybe worked better as a short story, which I think it initially did. I think it was fleshed out from a short story. And uh, I've not read the short story, so maybe that one is, is a little more streamlined. If you dug this, I have a Patreon where I upload long form reviews of each book that I read as I read them. I tend to go into a lot more depth and detail, and my thoughts about the books are fresher because it's right after I finish a book that I will record a video. Videos at this point tend to be around 15 to 20 minutes long per book. It's five bucks a month. I think it's worth it. I also have started doing Q&A videos and trying to come up with ideas for stuff, like non-review stuff that I can put on there to make it worth it for you. So take a look. I'm really proud of it. People seem to like it. Link's in the description. And I doubt it'll be another three weeks until you see another one of these review videos. We can blame Stapledon. Blaming it on old Olaf. All right, thanks for watching.